Welcome back to Principles of Macroeconomics. So we're here, we're almost done with a quarter here. Monetary policy is the act of increasing the money supply or decreasing the money supply to affect interest rates to stabilize the economy. That's always the goal, right? Of fiscal and monetary policy. So how does monetary policy actually work? What are the tools and what do they look like in action? That's today's topic. And so how actually does the Fed do its thing with the money supply and interest rates? The three tools of monetary policy and how they work are the subject of this mini lesson. So the three tools are adjusting the required reserve ratio, adjusting the discount rate, and open market operations. We'll look at the third, open market operations, in more detail. But the first two simply look at how to get banks loaning more or loaning less. To loan more, as you recall, means that banks increase loans and that increases deposits throughout the banking system via the money multiplier. And so anything that the Fed does that increases banks' loaning ability will increase the money supply. So adjusting the required reserve ratio will do just that. And the Federal Reserve has control over the legal minimum required reserve ratio. So if they want banks to loan out more and increase the money supply, they'll reduce the required reserve ratio. And if they want to decrease the money supply, they'll do the opposite. That will force banks to hold more back in reserves and be able to loan less out. The second tool is adjusting the discount rate. Banks can borrow from the Fed if they need to, and adjusting the discount rate means that the Fed charges more or less to banks when banks need to borrow money from the Fed to meet their required reserve ratio. If they want to discourage banks from loaning out too much and coming up short on their required reserves, they'll increase the discount rate to decrease the money supply. But if they wanted to increase the money supply, they would reduce the discount rate, thereby reducing the penalty that banks have to pay to the Federal Reserve if they come up short with reserves because they've loaned out too much and need to come cap in hand to the Fed. So those are the first two tools of, the, of monetary policy. They are used very rarely. The last one is used quite a bit. In fact, it's used daily. So this is the most important tool of monetary policy. But before we get into the details, the nitty gritty of it, let's think about um, what it is exactly is going on. So monetary policy and the interest rate, um, the whole key to understanding why monetary policy works is that increasing or decreasing the money supply has effects on the interest rate, as covered in the last mini lecture about the interaction of money markets and aggregate demand. A few terms for you to know. The target federal funds rate is that rate that the Federal Reserve watches. It's the one key interest rate in the whole economy that um, matters. So it's a short-run interest rate. Um, the federal funds is a market where banks borrow from each other overnight. Um, it sounds pretty boring, but it's pretty crucial to the operations of every bank. So um, if you think about it, the 10% required reserve ratio is probably really hard to hit exactly on every day. So some banks will have too many reserves, they'll have excess reserves. They weren't able to loan out that day. And some banks won't have quite enough. They perhaps, perhaps they've loaned out too many or not enough loans have been repaid. And so um, there's extra cash sitting around for some banks, and some banks need cash to meet their required reserve ratio. So there is a market, and the Federal Reserve allows banks to borrow and loan to each other overnight, and this is called the federal funds market. And if you think about it, because every bank is involved in either borrowing or lending every day, probably that interest rate that they pay or receive is going to be a key cost of production for them. So we can think about that one federal funds rate as the key short-term interest rate for the economy because all other interest rates are built upon it if you consider that that federal funds rate is a key uh, cost of doing business for a bank. If it rises, they're going to have to increase all their other costs as well. They're going to have to charge more for loans um, if they have to pay more for their own uh, in the federal funds market, for instance. So all the, all the we, we think that all short-term interest rates sort of move together and they're all built on this federal funds rate. So 
when the Federal Reserve does its thing and, and thinks about increasing or decreasing interest rates, in the world of interest rates, uh, there's one most important interest rate, and that is the federal funds rate. So that federal funds market, again, is um, exists for the purpose of doing of allowing banks to borrow from each other. And so this federal funds market is a very important one. And it exists not only in the U.S., but it exists all over the place. So this is the LIBOR is the London Interbank Offered Rate is their equivalent to our federal funds rate. Two more terms for you. Expansionary monetary policy will be increasing the money supply to increase spending, right? Because as you recall, increasing the money supply de decreases the interest rate. And, in, and decreasing the money supply increases the interest rate. So contractionary monetary policy is named because it tries to contract spending by increasing interest rates. It's also called tight money policy. So the discount rate is the rate that the Fed charges banks. If the banks are short on their reserves, they can either borrow from each other or they can borrow from the Fed. And the Fed, of course, can encourage or discourage banks from borrowing directly from the Fed. All right, so here's the nitty gritty of open market operations. When the Fed buys anything, reserves increase. So you can think about the Fed as sort of living outside of the economy, holding on to a bunch of cash. And if they want, they can helicopter in a bunch of cash to increase the money supply and decrease interest rates. That's not a bad visual for what actually happens. Now, of course, they don't have helicopters, or maybe they do, but they don't use the helicopters, and also they don't use bags of cash. But the idea is cash gets into the economy or gets out, and that's the main working of monetary policy. So let's assume for a minute that it's apples that they're buying. So the reason why they don't helicopter in money is, of course, that would be weird, disruptive, all sorts of things. Um, it's actually much more plausible and uh, less chaotic if they show up to the economy to some stores and buy some stuff, right? Those are channels that are much more uh, less chaotic. So let's, let's say they show up to the Apple store and buy some apples. Money goes from the Federal Reserve's bank account, from their uh, store of money, if you will, into the economy. They've, they've received apples and in return they give cash to the economy. So the reserves um, deposits increase in the bank that the Apple store uses, right? And then you can see the monetary multiplier begin to work. Of course, apples isn't a very uh, plausible thing to do. It's not, apples are not going to store nicely. Um, and probably there's not a single store that can supply enough apples that the Federal Reserve needs on a daily basis to increase or decrease the money supply. So they buy something that doesn't rot. They buy something that um, has storage ability and, in fact, is pretty uh, petite in storage. And so they, the, what the Federal Reserve actually buys and sells is not apples, but federal government bonds. So this can be a little bit confusing because people think that the wonder about that relationship. But basically, it's just a convenient thing to purchase for the Fed, and money gets from the Fed into the economy. Um, and these are, by the way, they're used bonds, and they're uh, all sorts of different sizes and lengths. Um, and of course, as you know, the U.S. government is heavily in debt, like most democratic governments. And so there's a lot of borrowing that needs to be done to fund daily operations. That's where these bonds are written. But the bonds, the reason that it's called open market operations is that the Federal Reserve uh, really tries to be independent of the federal government, and they don't actually buy directly from the Federal Reserve. Pardon me. They don't, the Federal Reserve doesn't buy directly from the federal government. They buy rather on the open market. So they buy used bonds, um, resold bonds, if you will, on the open market. There's in the markets for investments, people are buying and selling investment instruments all day long, stocks, bonds, you name it. There's a heavy market for treasury bills or treasury bonds. So that's what the Fed shows up and buys, not apples. And a quick question if you want to think about this one. Why is the Federal Reserve independent of the federal government? 
what do you imagine would happen if they weren't that way? So in a thought experiment, do you think inflation would be higher or lower if the Fed were not independent? If the president could lean on the chairman or chairwoman, in this case, of the Federal Reserve to do their bidding, what might an incumbent president want, president want to do when he or she is up for re-election? Certainly we've seen evidence that the, that the president has been able to, in some cases, achieve expansionary fiscal policy to try to speed the economy up. They might try to do the same thing if they had control over monetary policy. And the Federal Reserve is designed to be deliberately um, independent from the federal government for the very reason that we need a policy that is not um, able to be captured by the by federal government. So we think, to answer the question, economists think that inflation is probably going to be higher if the Fed and the Federal Reserve, um, the Federal Reserve and the federal government were um, in cahoots. But since they're not, we think inflation is a bit lower because the Federal Reserve has a long-term interest in uh, stable economic growth, whereas federal government might have re-election desires that um, would speed up the economy no matter what's happening, speed up the economy to get votes, um, and speeding up the economy means more inflation. So here's what open market operations look like in practice. So they buy or sell government debt or government bonds, treasury bills, treasury bonds, those are all synonyms. And here's what happens. So remember our bank T accounts. Um, on the asset side, uh, the Federal Reserve has owns government debt because it's bought some in the past, right? It's bought bills in the past. And its liabilities are the monetary base. Not super important. Um, but you want to think about if you're if you're into accounting, that's how they do it. And Here's how it works. If they want to increase the money supply, they need to in inject cash and reserves into the system. And to decrease money supply, they must suck that extra money up. So there's a vacuum sort of sucking up the um, extra money. So here's um, a worked example. If the, if the Federal Open Market Committee purchases $100 million um, in government bonds. There's a hundred million dollars that go into um, that go into the reserves of banks and of course the banks that sold them the hundred million are going to be transferring out of their um, holding that hundred million. So they lose a hundred million in treasury bills but they gain a hundred million in cash. So think about what happens now when banking system gains cash the money multiplier begins to work. And in reverse, if you have um, the Federal Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve selling government bonds, 100 million goes into commercial banks' assets and they lose 100 million in cash for that transfer. And the money multiplier, the monetary multiplier, will work in reverse. Some worry that when the Fed buys bonds, when it expands the money supply to get interest rates down, that this is going to uh, create a Zimbabwe or Germany type of inflation, hyperinflation, super high, super fast. It's going to um, devalue the currency to the point where we have to start over with a new currency. Part of those fears come from a misunderstanding that it's not actual printing of cash that happens but it's rather electronic money that's created, and electronic money can be created and destroyed very easily. So once it's created, it does not need to exist forever. In fact, the Federal Reserve will increase the money supply electronically on days that they need to increase the money supply to get interest rate down, and vice versa. Every single day, they're adjusting the money supply up and down. It's not a permanent thing. So here's some causa, uh, causation for you. You want to, if the Fed wants to increase the money supply, it buys the treasury bonds or treasury bills. The reserves increase for the bank. Banks loan out with more reserves and money supply increases. And on the flip side, if they want to sell treasury, if they want to decrease the money supply, they sell T-bills, 
reserves in the banking system decline and fewer new loans are uh, made. In fact, some loans are called back in and the money, money creation process works in reverse. The money multiplier will reduce total money supply. So here's a practice question for you. Suppose this is the only bank and all money is held in this bank. There are no excess reserved. They are fully loaned up. If the Fed makes an open market sale of $50 worth of T-bills to this bank, what happens to the money supply after all adjustments are made? So it's a money multiplier question. $50 worth of injections to reserves. What will happen? The way you want to solve this problem is to figure out what the required reserve ratio is, and we can figure that out from looking at the bank's prior um, position. The required reserves were 100 and deposits were 1,000, um, and there are no excess reserves, right? So that's a 10% required reserve ratio. 10% required reserve ratio means a money multiplier of 10, right? 1 divided by the required reserve ratio, 1 divided by 0.1 is 10. And $50 worth of uh, new reserves means 50 times 10 or 500 um, happens. And it's a decrease, right, because the Fed sold T-bills. It did not buy T-bills. So reserves will decrease by 50 initially. And then the money multiplier works to tenfold, decrease of 500. And there you have it.